Okay, so let's get started. It is a great pleasure to welcome you to our Wolfson guest lecture series on health, environment and architecture, discourses from the past, challenges for the present, perspectives for the future. And you can see that a classicist was part of the team uh, because otherwise there wouldn't be this emphasis on the past. But I think it's quite important to keep an eye on uh, the historical dimension. I'll say a few things about that in just a moment. We very much regret that our inaugural event needs to take place in an online format. However, both our speaker, Emily Webster, and my co-organizer, Jonathan Wistow, have caught the coronavirus in the interest of everybody's health. We have decided to refrain from a face-to-face -face event. Personally, I'm all the more grateful to both Emily and Jonathan that they are making themselves available today. And here I speak on behalf of my other Wolfson team members. First of all, let me say a few words on the focus of this series of guest lectures. It is one of the central ideas and purposes of the Wolfson Research Institute for Health and Wellbeing, not only to bring together colleagues from different disciplines, but also to reach out to a wider audience by addressing topics of a more general interest. We strongly believe that the theme chosen for this series of events is perfect in that regard, because it literally concerns everybody. After a major pandemic and a seemingly endless chain of natural disasters, we live in a period where health issues and environmental factors play an enormously important role in our daily lives. They have a direct impact on how and where we live and work. In other words, architecture, environment and health are inextricably intertwined. Our guest lectures will try to address these issues from different perspectives and research backgrounds. We are not only concerned with modern concepts and perceptions, but also want to include approaches with a historical dimension, likely to inspire current debates. This way, a wide range of disciplines will be given the opportunity to be heard and taken into account. Before I move on to the introduction of our speaker for today, let me express my sincere thanks to my Wolfson colleagues, in particular to my co-organizer, Jonathan Wistow, and to Susie Boyd, the manager and good soul of the Wolfson Research Institute, whose extraordinary professionalism and utter devotion and dedication keep us all going. Working with them is a real privilege. So let me now introduce Dr. Emily Webster, to whom we are extremely grateful for being prepared to deliver the opening lecture of our series. She is a system professor in the history and philosophy of health and medicine in the Department of Philosophy at Durham University. Her research focuses on the ecology of historical epidemics, drawing on contemporary biology and ecology alongside traditional historical methods. She has a particular interest in the relationship between historical ecology and geographies of knowledge in the 19th century British imperial periphery. Currently, she is working on a monograph entitled Infectious e Ecologies, a Biological History of Epidemics in the urban British Empire. And I believe what you are presenting today is probably part of that project, Emily. Emily also serves as a co-associate director of the Center for Philosophy of Epidemiology, Medicine and Public Health, and is an affiliated researcher on the AHRC IRC funded project, Typhoid, Caucus and Terrorism. Looking forward to an exciting paper, I shall now hand over to Emily, whose title is Building Out the Rat, Urban Improvement and Ecologies of the Bombay Plague Epidemic, 1896 to 1920. Emily, the floor is yours. Great, thank you so much, Thorsten. Um, I'm so glad to be joining you. This is such a great like, series in terms of its topic, its scope, the researchers presenting. I'm very honored to be the first presenter. Um, so I'll go ahead and share my screen so that I can show you some pictures of the Bombay plague epidemic. So um, what I'm going to talk about today is part of a chapter from my book project, um, which looks at the relationship between uh, imperial infrastructure building and epidemic disease in the British Empire. And uh, the final chapter of the book is uh, interested in the question of reactions to epidemics and how they shape urban infrastructures uh, and the ways that logics of disease and scientific discovery around these epidemics provide uh, impetus for different kinds of urban planning that have lasting effects on both the disease and the structure of the cities. Uh, 
Um, so with that intro, I'll just get started. Um, so in September of 1896, Dr. Ochasio Villegas was called to this uh, to Manvi, a neighborhood in Bombay, India, to attend a series of patients who were exhibiting unusual symptoms. He arrived at the Chal, uh, informal housing, occupied by over 600 laborers working in the grain trade, to find 18 people delirious with high fever and tender swelling in the armpit or groin areas. Um, Viegas, aware of the epidemic that had been ravaging Hong Kong for two years, quickly brought word to the municipal government. Plague had arrived in Bombay. Within weeks, the disease exploded across the city, infecting thousands. Nearly a third of the population fled to the countryside, carrying it with them. And by the end of the year, nearly 2,000 people in the city had died from plague. The following year, 10,000. Many ports across the increasingly connected 19th century world, from Hong Kong to Hawaii, experienced an outbreak of plague in the subsequent three decades. In Bombay, however, the epidemic took on a cyclical pattern, exacting annual tolls much larger than those experienced in any other urban port. Conservative estimates place the total number of deaths in Bombay City at 175,000, or roughly 20% of the city's pre-pandemic population. While rats had been long been tied to epidemics of plague, um, in the early years of the third plague pandemic, the etiology of plague had not been firmly established. Theories identified contaminated soil, infected grain or cotton, person-to-person -person transmission, and other pathways as potential sources of infection. This proliferation of theories had much to do with central tension in the etiology of plague noted by imperial scientists and administrators that the disease was at once international in its spread, arising in port towns as disparate as Glasgow, Cape Town, Sydney, and San Francisco, and place-based, prone to variations that seemed highly related to local characteristics, including occupation, crowding, housing type, and sanitary systems. As the second largest city in the British Empire and a hub of imperial scientific activity, the city of Bombay became a focal point of plague knowledge gathering activity and public health intervention. This activity was undertaken at various levels of government, each of which brought to the intervention a different set of presuppositions about the disease and vested interests that shaped the recommendations for intervention. With tensions between popular miasmatic and saprophytic theories of disease, those that focused on air and dirt, and increasingly popular rat flea theories of disease, multiple strategies arose within Bombay's municipal and imperial government structures to alter the urban environment in the name of plague control. The Bombay Improvement Trust, a municipal organization established in 1898 to carry out urban beautification projects, focused on the structure of the urban system and nominally how best to restructure the urban environment, streets, neighborhoods, and homes to control the spread of plague, relying heavily at first on hygienic theories of disease and then on rat flea theories of disease to enact a comprehensive scheme for the improvement of the city of Bombay, more especially in respect to the better ventilation of densely inhabited parts, this is from their mission statement, the removal of insanitary dwellings and the prevention of overcrowding. In the succeeding 50 years, the trust undertook projects to improve the crowded central areas of the city, relocate, relocating thousands of residents to install wide boulevards, planned neighborhoods and railway lines to carry residents and goods out to new suburbs. Uh, meanwhile, the Plague Research Committee, a committee appointed by the government of the Bombay Presidency to investigate the origins and spread of plague, simultaneously embarked on a series of experiments in a replica neighborhood in Perel Laboratory to establish which parts of local housing in the city allowed for rats and rat fleas to enter and spread plague. While both organizations nominally had the same goal, to draw on understandings of the mechanisms by which plague spread in Bombay to intervene on the built environment to stop the chain of transmission, their approach and the effects of these approaches were wildly different, with disparate but enduring effects on the built environment, the city, and the city's residents. Looking to these two major organizations that sought to intervene on the place-based nature of plague, the Bombay Improvement Trust and the Plague Research Committee, this paper will explore how projects undertaken by each that sought to build out the rat in the city, um, examine, it'll examine the plans of each organization and their effect on the built environment and argue that these differing approaches reflected disparate interests, ideologies, and conceptions of the relationship between disease and environment among differing levels of governance. 
and that the tensions between municipal and scientific interests and their respective influence on and interest in local plague conditions resulted in a failure of projects to actually build out the rat and indeed may have altered urban ecosystems in ways that provided additional opportunities for plague transmission. In the wake of the arrival of plague in 1896, the Improvement Trust Act of 1898 established the Bombay Improvement Trust, a municipal organization charged with enacting a comprehensive scheme for improvement of the city of Bombay. The trust set out with five major goals. First, to improve and block of areas declared to be insanitary and incapable of any less drastic measure. Second, to create new streets for the purpose of affording efficient ventilation to the more crowded parts of the city and of increasing and improving the means of intercommunication. Thirdly, the improvement and development of available areas in the island in reclaiming of land from the sea to provide building sites for the expansion of the city. Fourth, in connection with the foregoing, the provision of sanitary accommodation to the poor and working classes who are displaced by those operations. And finally, to connect with the street and improvement schemes, accommodation for the police. While initially these plans aligned with contemporary theories of plague transmission, and indeed the impetus for the organization was the plague epidemic, it focused on ventilation, clearing of potential, potentially contagious miasma, and the removal of filth and overcrowding. Bacteriological inquiry quickly identified the rat as the primary culprit of disease transmission instead of these measures. The first several publications on the rat flea theory of plague emerged in the same year, 1898, and steadily gained traction among the medical community. While the Improvement Trust often paid lip service to the rat flea theory and increasing recommendations from the Bombay Bacteriological Laboratory to focus on rat control, it often relied overwhelmingly on miasmatic and hygienic theories of disease, which together formed what historian Prashant Kadambi has referred to as a contingent contagionism to guide their building standards, targeting overcrowding, narrow streets, and poor ventilation in their designs, and using contagion theory to justify these uh, areas of improvement. One of the main targeted neighborhoods was that of Manvi, the neighborhood in which plague first emerged. The Improvement Trust cleared major swaths of low income and informal housing in the neighborhood to make space for wide thoroughfares and single family housing. While the 36,000 square yard area was first earmarked for destruction in 1898, by 1906, prolonged legal battles with residents meant that the project had only just acquired the majority of buildings. Plans entailed the demolition of all houses in the area with plans for widening streets and buildings constructed on sanitary principles to occupy the frontages. It displaced residents of 52 buildings on 7,910 square yards of land with plans to rehouse only a portion of them. Here's a picture of some of the trolls that the um, Improvement Trust built. Rehousing plans perpetuated some of the key structural issues of the neighborhood, namely constructing houses which contained shops and go-downs on the ground floor and one-room tenements on the upper floors, uh, a structure that had been highlighted by the Bombay Plague Committee to be particularly conducive to the transmission of plague because of the way that rats could live in these shops and then move upstairs into people's homes. And this demonstrated the trust general disregard for plague etiology, despite the clear understanding of the epizootic nature of the disease indicated in their investment in common sense rat exterminator during the same year, a highly ineffective rat controls uh, poison. Uh, improvement schemes, which also removed, while also removing this unsanitary housing from one of the highest plague mortality areas of the city, focused on expanding a main artery through the city that terminated at the GIP railway. The project thus served the purpose of both demolishing a neighborhood that had become a symbol of plague in the city and opening up a clear pathway for the manufacturing districts on the railway and shipping lines. While the Improvement Trust utilized emergency law to further its schemes, the residents of the neighborhoods they intended to clear tried to use the same legal scaffolding to counter these plans, slowing the projects down and indicating how poorly set they were for the population of the city. Across the improvement schemes, the trust overwhelmingly engaged in forced removals of residents and homeowners from their properties by law. Um, and in 1907, of the 1,800 or 188 properties acquired by the improvement trust, 770 of them had been acquired by the courts, while only 419 had been acquired through amicable settlement. This divide widened in 1910, where only 46 cases were settled amicably and 813 were fought out. 
residents' reluctance to relinqu relinquish their properties was no doubt amplified by the lack of alternative housing. The trust's failure to rehouse the estimated three to 400,000 people that it had displaced in these schemes remained a consistent point of controversy. In 1915, the executive health officer, J.A. Turner, noted that over the 10 years previously, the City Improvement Trust had already demolished a large number of houses without any serious attempt having been made to then to provide accommodation for those displaced. Semi-permanent accommodation was only provided for a total of 15,000 people by 1909, probably less than one out of 20 of what was really required. As a result, tenants and homeowners removed from their properties often faced a scarcity of housing and increased cost of rent, which actually worsened crowding. The executive health officer noted that these people moved into accommodation shared by others and therefore increased the problem of crowding all over the city and in neighborhoods that had previously not experienced problems with crowding, which was an ideal circumstance for the spread of plague and inspectors. So studies by the Bombay Bacteriological Laboratory suggested that the improvement schemes continued to be hotspots for plague transmission. So even these spaces that had been improved in the name of plague uh, transmission were just as bad. Uh, with one chawl constructed by the trust abandoned in 1906 because of the severe outbreak of plague. The estates also seem to have constructed an ecological niche for another deadly disease in Bombay, malaria. So there was a high death rate from malaria in multiple of these new schemes because of the pooling of water, because the schemes kind of failed to account for rain patterns in, in their building of uh, different urban structures. For those who managed to stay in their homes, the risk of infection also likely didn't improve. Recent studies in rat urban ecology suggest that habitat destruction often leads to colony collapse, which in turn leads to rats ranging further than their habitat, their typical habitats, which brings them and, their inf um, and any infections they might be carrying into closer contact with other subpopulations. Anecdotal evidence from the epidemic suggests this likely happens. Uh, happened. W.B. Bannerman, the head of the Bombay Bacteriological Laboratory, noted that it was common after disinfecting a house or a street infected with plague to see neighboring houses or streets suddenly become infected, which makes some sense if we think about the rats fleeing that house and moving into the next house. So in parallel with the activity of the Bombay Improvement Trust, um, in and specifically in October 1905 and January, to January 1906, there was a different, highly unusual ecology unfolding in a cluster of houses behind Perel Laboratory in a suburb of Bombay. Monkeys, guinea pigs, and rats, both wild and tame, were being released into these perfect replicas of the traditional workers' huts or go-downs that were present in the city of Bombay. The animals were set loose, placed in cages, or suspended a few feet off the ground. The wild rats were allowed to nest on wire mesh netting in the roofs, keeping them separate but proximate to laboratory animals. And some huts had mangalore tile roofs, some traditional tile, and some concrete. Inside these buildings, however, the experimental animals awaited this grim fate. Some of the animals or the fleas carrying, they carried with them had been infected with virulent Yersinia pestis, the causative organism of plague. And for many of them, this would mean a swift and violent death. These experiments carried out by the Bombay Plague Research Committee were designed to examine the transmission dynamics of plague in the city and in doing so contribute to a wider program of research that emerged globally to establish an etiology, epidemiology, and prevention of plague in the wake of the third plague pandemic, but also explain the local conditions of plague and why they were so unusual. Scientific knowledge about the complex ecological relationship between Xenops lachiapis, which is the flea that carries plague from rats to humans, um, urban rats and human epidemics of plague was theorized but not fully accepted at this point, if we remember from earlier. And between 1898 and 1910, the Indian Medical Service conducted a series of epidemiological and bacteriological experiments and knowledge gathering practices in an attempt to observe, characterize, and define the boundaries of plague within the city as part of this larger imperial knowledge competition towards understanding plague. Large-scale rat capture campaigns brought rats and rat fleas under the gaze of the medical service. Meanwhile, animal experiments on guinea pigs, rats, and rat fleas exposed the mechanisms of plague transmission and provided evidence for the urban epidemiology of the disease. Simultaneously, efforts were abounding to find a chemical or biological agent capable of controlling the spread of plague, 
largely through experiments using agricultural poisons like common sense rat exterminator bought by the Bombay Improvement Trust, um, imported from elsewhere in the British Empire, very few of which through the experiments of the committee proved effective. Historians of science and environment like Helen Tilly, Daniel Hedrick and others have demonstrated how in the first half of the 20th century, a practice, a practice of using colonial sites as living laboratories emerged in which scientific knowledge gathering practices around human and non-human disease increasingly controlled field experiments designed to document, describe, and translate the mechanisms of disease transmission. Bombay at the turn of the 20th century became a laboratory for testing the transmission dynamics of plague and relying on extensive surveillance infrastructure and the unique cyclic nature of the plague in the city, the members of the Pla Indian Plague Commission designed these experiments that took into account the ecological conditions of the city and the predictable epizootic among wild rats to establish a rigorous course of inquiry into that relationship. So these multi-species experiments, at once very local and also designed to test general theories of plague transmission, were important in carrying a broader etiology of plague or developing a broader etiology of plague that carried lasting impacts on the etiology of the disease. So at the same time that we have an organization that's using outdated and um, reactive theories of plague to demolish houses and restructure the city, in the same city, we have the cutting edge research happening on plague transmission and etiology. The rat and rat flea experiments conducted in Bombay were notable for several reasons. First, um, the experiments treated the urban space as a field of its own. It used the city of Bombay and its locally specific urban ecologies and um, to like play with the porosity between controlled and uncontrolled environments to drive and design inquiry, which is interesting from a scientific perspective. They also, the way that the specific ecology of plague in the city shaped the structure of the experiments is quite interesting with scientists using both cyclical, the cyclical nature of the epidemic and its sheer scale to both justify why they were doing the experiments there and also to inform the structure of the experiments. And then finally, the scope of their contribution to plague etiology is quite notable here, right? It became, while ec ecological specificity was a significant role in how, played a significant role in how these experiments were designed, um, their embeddedness in this global um, multiscalar knowledge infrastructure and the outward facing nature of their experiments meant these findings were widely adopted and accepted as in indicative of a more general plague etiology and epidemiology. So some of the most thorough experiments were the rat flea, were the experiments on the rat flea connection undertaken uh, in the years 1906 to 1907, as previously mentioned. So robust surveillance infrastructures and existing experiments by the government laboratory had already raised a series of questions about the relationship between Bombay's urban structure and the plague epizootic. Um, Bannerman, the president of the Bombay uh, Bacteriological Laboratory, notes in his 1906 experiments that differing roof and housing structure types that are present in the city of Bombay appear to be more or less conducive to rats, claiming that the structure of the houses in the country seemed to be designed to favor the continued existence within them of the black rat. In Bombay, the roofs of round country tiles and curious shelf-like projections found in almost every room in the chawls where firewood and dung cakes are stored afford them ideal places for shelter and breeding. The spatial dimensions of these epidemics and the scale provided an ecological grounding through which to examine transmission mechanisms of disease in this way. So the plague committee designed a series of ecological experiments to test the transmission pathways of urban plague environments grounded in this observation that Bannerman made. Um, and so what they did was develop a series of replica go-downs or um, houses designed in the style commonly seen in Bombay. The body of the buildings were constructed to be rat proof with nine inch walls built of brick and mortar and concrete floors on top of a high plinth or slab. So you'd have to step up to get into them. Um, inside an inspection chamber was made of wire netting about three by three feet and connected to wire netting, netting covering the inside of the roof but separated from the rest of the hut which prevented anything that might settle in the roof from then entering the hut which effectively creates a little rat barrier inside the building. So the rats can settle on that netting, but they can't enter the building. And once identical huts had been constructed, and we see examples of them here, um, the next step was to engineer environments in which wild 
Bombay rats, the rats that are already present in the city, would colonize the roofs. And so drawing on observation from the city, Bannerman and Liston construct three types of roofing material across six huts. The first two, one and two, are furnished with country tile, which is the type Bannerman sees as conducive to rat colonization. The second two, three and four, with Mangalore tiles, which is a red clay tile commonly used for roofing across India. And the third two, five and six, of corrugated steel. And choices in roofing were based on ecological observations of rat density and plague mortality. Um, in the case of, yeah, so in the case of the first two, the most protection, the, or offer the most protection to rats, the most likely to be colonized. The second two, kind of intermediate, and the last two are supposed to be rat proof. Um, and so, What's also notable here is that Bannerman and Liston use the distinct seasonality of Bombay's epidemic to time their experiments. Um, the first three experiments were undertaken when plague cases were sporadic among the city's wild rats in June and July. They serve as the control experiments. The remaining three tested against these original three occur during a period where the epizootic is just starting. So they wait until the epizootic is starting and then um, some of these experiments were conducted in a way that um, they relied on existing ep the ep existing epizootic as it emerged to jump to experimental guinea pigs and to observe the trajectory of the epizootic among inoculated and un in unoculated guinea pigs once it started. So some were inoculated against plague um, with the recent vaccine, some were not. In several cases, the epizootic was engineered, relying on the existence of fleas, whether infected or not, in these spaces already to then infect the laboratory organisms. Um, for example, in one experiment, five guinea pigs were inoculated with a virulent culture of Yersinia pestis to induce acute plague, and then placed into a go-down with 26 other guinea pigs, resulting in an epizootic of the most rapid description, with 115 fleas isolated from the last five animals to die of the disease. So 115 um, on five animals, that's just a lot of fleas. Um, so we can also see within the construction of these buildings and experiments, that there are clear attempts to control for competing theories of plague transmission. Um, so for example, in huts number one and three, a certain amount of light was allowed to penetrate through a small glass window in the tiles and a small ventilation hole established in housing which tests the role of sunlight and airflow on the spread of the microbe in line with the hygienic theories and miasmatic theories that the Bombay Improvement Trust was relying on. In multiple experiments, guinea pigs or chimpanzees were suspended in their own cages above the floor to avoid possible interaction with feces or urine or infected soil, or set in cages where fly paper was placed around the bottom of the cages to prevent fleas from jumping in. And so we have lots of attempts to control for existing logics of disease and isolate out different competing etiologies. And so some studies relied much more explicitly on the ecology of plague to examine transmission dynamics, getting rid of the controlled environments, and just instead loosing guinea pigs in houses recently impacted by plague around the city. In a series of studies where guinea pigs were either allowed to run free in the houses where plague had broken out, or left in these houses in cages of similar structure to those previously noted, the guinea pigs were then recaptured and often had up to 40 fleas on them each, which were then isolated and examined for signs of Yersinia pestis. And often at least 40% of the fleas were carrying the bacteria. And more often than not, the guinea pigs died. Perhaps most damningly, the same results occurred when guinea pigs were allowed to run free in houses that had been disinfected with sulfuric acid at the outbreak of plague to much the same result, was suggested that British sanitary disinfection practices were not effective in removing fleas from houses and therefore ineffective in, in uh, preventing the reemergence of plague. So Indian medical service officers also drew on the unique seasonality of plague um, to look at the role of climate on flea transmission, um, a set of findings that's still commonly cited in descriptions of flea population dynamics in literature. Um, disparities between existing literature on the temperature of the activity of fleas inspired studies like those conducted in the fourth report in which a large number of observations on the effects of temperature um, on the transmission of plague by fleas have been carried out in specially constructed rooms both above and below ordinary room temperature to see how quickly uh, 
fleas replicated and reproduced under different temperature conditions. And the commission uh, found that it that explained a lot about the seasonal prevalence of the disease. So we're seeing multiple avenues through which uh, the relationship between rats, rat fleas, and Bombay's climate are being explained by these experimental structures. And so from these experiments in which the epizootics were manufactured within controlled environments or observed in the broader ecology, a number of claims about the mechanisms of the transmission of plague were posited and solidified. And from them, a series of recommendations made that specified specific interventions into the urban structure um, were made. And so that includes things like specified rat guards um, for rat proofing, changes in housing material, and other moderate shifts in housing structure that could significantly curb the transmission of plague within the city based on the existing structure of the house and of the neighborhoods. Indeed, over the next 20 years, publications reviewing the advancement of knowledge in plague epidemiology and ecology would directly cite the findings of the commission as the definitive proof of the rat flea transmission cycle. And yet, there's little evidence that the findings of the Plague Research Committee were seriously considered by the Bombay Improvement Trust in their improvement schemes. In fact, in the 1913 report of the Improvement Trusts, uh, it cites the city's medical officer of health, J.A. Turner, in dismissing the Plague Research Committee's findings, claiming that they were not likely to, su to suffice to extinguish the epidemic and that a more drastic remedy involving the demolition of the most insanitary areas of the city should instead be adopted without delay. And this viewpoint stands in stark contrast to the reception of the findings of the Play Research Committee in the international medical community. They published extensively in the Journal of Hygiene and other sanitary conferences. Um, British, French, German bacteriologists cited them as definitive proof of the rat flea theory of disease and of the ecology of plague, all based in their analysis of how the city's infrastructure affected plague. So what's going on here? Um, why did the Bombay Improvement Trust continue to construct its town plans nominally for the purposes of alleviating plague mortality based on outdated ideas of plague that were clearly not mitigating the diseases in the city? Focused on issues of light, ventilation, and foul odor did serve an important purpose to the trust in ways that um, the rat flea theory did not, and that it provided a logical basis for the destruction of slums an intervention that maximized opportunities for investment projects. Historian Shabnam Tajani notes, for example, that much of the land in question and that was targeted by the trust sat near the mill district and thus was extremely desirable from an investor's point of view. Most schemes didn't result in the trust's uh, so-called overcrowded areas uh, in neighborhoods as sites of new urban infrastructure, uh, railroads, large streets connecting important commercial zones in the city, um, that would be highly attractive to investors. So rather than focusing on the areas where there was actually measurably high plague, they targeted areas that seemed to be uh, useful for widening streets and connecting railroads. This, con this conflict of interest wasn't lost on contemporaries either. William Harvey, the municipal commissioner of Bombay, criticized the Improvement Trust heavily in 1913 when he observed that the works of the trust, though certainly and I quote, certainly beneficial in dealing with several insanitary areas has not yielded the advantage as an actual plague measure, which is, it was in the first instance undoubtedly intended to afford. It is an, a, fair, a fair question for consideration whether the immediate treatment of insanitary areas from which disease radiates to the surrounding localities is not of greater urgency than the construction of streets through the city. Looking at these two cases together, we see two examples of vastly different approaches to conflicting sanitary goals among municipal health authorities and the Plague Research Committee. And this, I argue, is, is kind of the central dissonance between the discoveries of the Bombay Plague Committee and the actions of the Bombay Improvement Trust. Um, it resulted in municipal authorities rejecting bacteriological innovation, much to the detriment of the city's plague-stricken residents and the municipal government itself. By focusing their findings on interventions into the imperial scientific debates, signified by the choice to publish their findings almost exclusively in the Journal of Hygiene, an internationally focused medical journal with limited audience among municipal officials, um, the Plague Research Committee 
didn't reach the audience that it necessarily should have for its locally driven interventions, though it specified that it thought that its interventions could really only be generalized to the city. It didn't put a lot of work into translating its findings for the local community so much as intervening on the international scientific debate. And meanwhile, the Bombay Improvement Trust vested interests in disease etiologies that facilitated urban development and speculation um, made them less likely to accept the rat flea theory of disease because it was less in line with the goals of development that improvement trusts traditionally had. And so the Plague Research Committee and the Bombay Improvement Trust together through this tension failed to implement place-based interventions for plague and the disease continued for another 30 years in the city. And in fact, they may have worsened it, as we see in the cases where the disease moved to different neighborhoods and houses based on development projects. While the Blake Research Committee's legacy is wide reaching and decidedly mixed, um, offering a foundational etiology for plague that unified international scientific knowledge about the disease, and the Bombay Improvement Trust legacy was a bit more straightforward and is perhaps best summarized by a satirical poem supposedly written by someone from Karachi published in the Times and read by the head of the organization at the 1905 Bombay Industrial Exhibition in summarizing the goals of his project. We may not have a Ballard Pier and passengers galore. We may not have a Taj Mahal upon our sandy shore. We may not have to live in an Apollo Bunder flat but we haven't an improvement trust and thank the Lord for that. Thank you.